Well, if you have your Bibles with me, there is a couple of verses, a couple of passages, excuse me, that we're going to kind of camp out on today. And so if you want to stick your finger in or a Bible marker in a couple of places, in Romans chapter 8 is one, and then in 1 John chapter 3, we're going to, we're going to look at some passages there uh, quite extensively. All of the verses that we're going to look at today, if you have a device that uh, is connected with the YouVersion app, um, if you click on Live, um, you will see Calvary Assembly of God show up um, right there, and um, you can tap on that, and you'll be able to follow along with all of the verses that we're going to share today. We are continuing in a series that we began at the beginning of 2017, where the first Sunday of every month, we're going back and looking at some of the foundational beliefs that we have as Christians. Um, I think that sometimes, if we're not careful, we can just assume that everybody knows what we're talking about, that we're all on the same page. And so it's good to go back and revisit these and make sure that we know what our foundation is. Because as any architect will tell you, if you want to build up, if you want to build something that's solid when you go up, you've got to have a firm, sure foundation. You can't have something that's iffy on your foundation or as you start building, you're going to teeter, you're going to probably end up collapsing. It's not going to be a safe structure for you to be in. So if we're going to build something strong in our Christian faith, we've got to revisit these foundations. So we are on foundational truth number five, which simply says this, that man's only hope of redemption is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Our only hope is found in Jesus. Now, let me go backwards a month for a second just to kind of set the stage. In our fourth truth, we looked at why we needed this redemption. We looked at the fall of man. And we saw that when man was created, he was created to be in this union with God. And we depicted it this way, that when man sinned, that there became this gulf, this chasm between God and man that was impossible for man to bridge the gap. Man is the one who sinned. And so we're the one that, that owes God something, if you will. We're, we're the debtor, and yet we've got, we're bankrupt. We've got nothing to pay off the debt. And so the only way that this gap between God and man could be bridged is for Jesus, the one that was God and man, the fully God, fully man. He's the only one that could come and die on a cross and shed his blood for our sins. He could say, as the Bible said about him, he became our sin. He didn't just take our sin on him. He became our sin. So in other words, he died in our place. And so then what our foundational truth number five says, that the only hope of our redemption is found in what Jesus did on the cross, our faith in him. Now, I want to key in for a second on that word only, because what happened rather quickly uh, in history, after Jesus ascended back to heaven, was that people started saying, they, they didn't discount what Jesus had done on his cross, but they started saying, this is good, but also we need fill in the blank. There would be things that they would start to add to it. They'd say, well, you know, Jesus did this for us, and that was the starting point, but now you also have to add. And, and so, if you're not careful... And, and many of the writers in, in the New Testament, the, and that's what some of the verses we're going to look at, they begin to spot this right away and say, hold on, hold on. If you follow that line of reasoning to where it goes, then what you're really going to say is that at some point, man might have been able to bridge this gap by himself, by what he was doing. He just hadn't tried enough things yet. If you start saying that, hey, it's Jesus plus something else, then what you're saying was that what Jesus did on the cross wasn't quite enough. Something else had to be added to that. And so we came to a point in history where this really came to a head, and there were several people that stood up to begin to, to call us back to the purity of what was said in the Scripture, and what Jesus had said, that, hey, it's not Jesus plus these other things. It's Jesus. He is our only hope. And that's the reason why that word only is so important there. And so this part in history was called the Reformation. 
And in the Reformation, there were five statements that came out, they're, they're in Latin, but they all key in with this first word, sola, which is the Latin word for only or exclusively. And so I want to show you the five sola statements, how it really portrays, I'm going to reword them slightly um, to have them uh, amplify what we're talking about today, Jesus being and his shed blood being the only way for us to have this redemption from our sins. The very first one is called sola scriptura. That means that only the scripture is our authority, not the scripture plus what some really educated person said about the scripture or what some really holy person said about the scripture, not what, what you know, this plus something else, but this is our final authority. And I love, there, there's a, a little account that Luke captures in the book of Acts as he's following Paul around on his journey. There's this little thing that he inserts in, in uh, Acts chapter 17 where he just says that Paul's speaking in this uh, city called Berea. And he said, the Bereans were very noble people. Every day after they listened to Paul speak, they'd go back to the scripture and they would search the scripture this is what Luke said, to see if what Paul said was true. All right? Now, that's what the Reformation called us back to do as well, is to say, all right, you know, I heard a pastor, or I heard evangelist, I heard somebody say this. Sounds kind of good. Is it here? Can I, can I find it here? Or were they taking what was here and kind of going off with their own idea of it? And so it's only the scripture that tells us now. Now, the second thing is... In the Latin, sola fide, means it's only by faith in Jesus. Now, you remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about in our BCAD series, we talked about um, the picture of in the Passover of the Old Testament, how Jesus fulfilled that in the New Testament. Remember in the, in the Old Testament, uh, that night of the Passover, they had to take a perfect lamb, sacrifice it, take its blood, and put it on the doorway of their house. And then when... God saw that he would pass over. And when we looked at it in the Second Testament, Jesus said, not only am I the perfect lamb, and not only is it my blood, but I'm also the door as well. And so think about the faith that they had. They said, we're going to put the, door, the blood on the door, and then by faith, we're going to step through the door and stay inside of our house, believing that that blood was enough. Jesus said the same thing. He said, it's when you place your faith in me, you step through the door that's been covered with my blood and stay there because it's by faith in me that you have this redemption, that you have this salvation. You've been bought back from your sin. It's not do some things, you know, it's no longer do we have to be the one to sacrifice the lamb and put the blood on the door of our house. Jesus said, I'm going to do all of it. Your faith is all in me. It's my blood. I'm the lamb, and I'm the door. Okay? Now, the third one, then, is sola gratia, which means it's only by grace. Grace is getting something good, something marvelous that we never deserved to get. Okay? Now, mercy is not getting the punishment that we deserve to get. Okay? I blew it. I should have gotten the punishment. Mercy says you don't get the punishment. But grace says not only do you not get the punishment, but you get all these rewards as well. And so our salvation, our redemption, is only gratia. It's only by the grace of God. It's not something that we earned. God didn't say, hey, you know what? You're, you're doing okay. You're trying, so I'll give this to you. What the Bible says is that there is none righteous. Okay? None of us escape that. And then it says, when we were the least worthy of God's love, that's when Jesus came to die on the cross. It was a gift of grace for us. Now, who did it? That's the fourth sola statement. It's sola Christus. It's only Jesus. Only Jesus. It's, it's his atoning power that did this. And even Jesus himself then pointed us to the fifth one. Why all of this? Sola Deo Gloria. It's all and only exclusively for the glory of God. Okay? So all of this comes back to what Jesus did. Our only hope for redemption is in the blood of Jesus that he shed on the cross. I like this quote from uh, Eric Metaxas. He said this, To try to earn God's love is to miss the point entirely. 
He already loves us. We can't be more loved by him. So to try is like adding numbers to infinity. You can't get higher than infinity, and his love for us is infinite. So we can't say, well, God, I, I want to, I thank you for what Jesus did for me, but now let me add some other things to it. You already have the infinite love of God. There is nothing you can do to make him love you more. And you know what else? There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. Amen. Amen. His love is already infinite towards you. And so how pitiful it is with us trying to pull out our little pennies to try to add to something that's already an infinite reward. Here, let's add this to it. It's, it's meaningless. God's already done the infinite work for us. And so our faith is just placed in what he did. So now I want us to look at uh, Romans chapter 8, if you've got that uh, in your Bible. Because the question comes up then, okay, so it's by faith. Now, let's go back to those Israelites in Egypt. By faith, they put the blood on the door and they stepped inside of their house. Now, how did they know that God's judgment had passed over their house? Well, it's pretty simple. When they woke up in the morning, their firstborn child was still alive. Right? They could look at it right there with their eyes. They could hug, hug them. They could touch them. Okay. So, but for us now, we use, I, I, so I pray this prayer. I, I ask, I believe that, that Jesus did this for me. I ask him to come into my life. I ask God to forgive me of my sins. How do I know that he's passed over, that his judgment has passed over me? Is there somebody I can hug as a result of that? You know, my firstborn child is still alive. How, how do I know this? Well, there's two things that the Bible tells us that let us know this. The first one is this inner witness of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to dig into both of these. But the, 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 when we pray this prayer and we invite Jesus to come into our life, his Holy Spirit comes into our lives and there is an inner witness there that tells us you have been redeemed. The, the, the judgment has passed over you. It's not going to fall on you. God loves you and he's forgiven your sins. There's a second one as well, and that is this outward evidence. Our life begins to change. We begin to behave differently. We begin to live differently because of this inner witness that we have on the inside. And it becomes this process because what the Holy Spirit does is when we live a, a certain way externally, then the Holy Spirit inside says, good job. Or the Holy Spirit goes, we need to still work on something here. We, we, need to, we need to clean this up a little bit. You're, you're heading in the right direction. But let's, let's, uh, let's work on this a little bit more. And so it becomes this, this cycle, the inward witness, the external evidence, the inward witness, the outside, you, know, you see what's going on. So in Romans chapter 8, verse number 1, the very first word says, therefore. So whenever we see therefore, what do we have to do? What's it there for? Yeah, what's it there for? It's connecting something, so we've got to back up. So if you look in Romans 7, especially starting around verse 14, what you're going to see the Apostle Paul saying a whole lot is, I, me, and mine. Okay? I don't want to do the bad things anymore. And so I am going to use my effort to not do the bad things anymore. Instead, I am going to work really hard, and I'm just going to clamp down, and I'm going to use my willpower to do the good things. And then he goes on to say, and as much as I try that, I find myself over here doing the bad things again. And I say, I don't want to do the bad things anymore. I want to do the good things. And I keep trying that. And, and if you notice, you'll go through several verses. There's no mention of God's help at all. It's just I, me, my, I, me, my, I, me, my. My effort, my ability is what I think. It's I'm going to try it, my willpower. Okay? And so then he gets to verse number 24, and he's hit rock bottom. He says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? I'm stuck. I'm in this cycle. I'm just constantly in this cycle of want to do the right thing, don't want to do the bad thing, find myself not doing the right thing, but doing the bad thing. What a wretched man I am. How am I ever going to get out of this? The very next verse. Thanks be to God. Here it is. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
I couldn't get out of this. I, me, and my couldn't do it. But thanks be to God, Jesus Christ did it and got me out of it. So, verse number one of chapter eight, he says, therefore, because Jesus got me out of it, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I went through the door, okay? I'm, I'm inside. He's the door that's been covered with his blood. I'm inside there, and so now there's no condemnation. No, the devil no longer can point a finger at me and say, you're a sinner, you blew it, you deserve hell, you deserve death. Okay? Because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So now, listen to the, the, some of the words here that speak to this idea of this inner witness of the Holy Spirit. He said, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death, for what the law was powerless to do in that it weak, was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man, there is fully God, fully man, in order that um, the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Now I want you to jump down to verse number 15, and you'll hear a little bit more here about this inner witness of the Holy Spirit. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. There's the, the inner witness of that. John, I'm just going to read this real quick in his um, third gospel, we're gonna, or third epistle. We're going to go back to this, but verse number... Um, 24 of John chapter 3 he says in here and this is how we know that he lives in us we know it by the spirit he gave us there's this inner witness that's there okay? now this leads us though to uh, just like I said how, how people real quickly after the ascension of Jesus started adding, well, it's Jesus plus these other things that have to take place, okay? There were two errors with these two thoughts that, that went, that took them the wrong direction, okay? The first error that, that goes along with this inner witness, and we, we read it right here, and, and people will pull this, it's, again, listen, this is an error, they're pulling it out of context, but we read it there in verse number two, that I've been set free from the law of sin and death. And so people say, well, I've been set free from the law. I've got this inner witness now inside of me that I'm, I'm okay. And so that means I can do what I want to do. Because what really matters is what God's telling me on the inside. And so that means, you know, I'm, I'm just free. I can pick this. I can do this. I can do what I want to do. As long as it feels okay on the inside, as long as I have that inner witness somewhere, well, how is anybody else other than you going to know that? Okay, it's just, just you. This is, becomes a very personal, very subjective thing to this is how I feel. Right? The other error, then, that goes the other way with this idea of the, the external evidence, the things that we see on the outside, in verse number 12 of Romans chapter 8, they, they will, again, this is an error, so they're just pulling it out of context. It says this, we have an obligation. We have an obligation. So it's great that you invited Jesus into your life, and yes, your sins have been forgiven, but now you have an obligation to live a certain way. You, you can't do things that you did before. You have to do things like this. This is how it has to look. And so you can see these, these two extremes. One of them is, I want to do what I want to do. And the other one says, I have to do this. Whether it, I, it feels good inside or not, I just, I have to do it. Whether it, you know, it doesn't matter. I have to do this. And it just, you know, no, I, I, I want to do this. So this is what I want to do. Nobody has to tell me anything. I don't have to do a thing. Okay. Friends, both of these come from the exact same root, and that's selfishness. Both of them, because you hear those words I in there? 
freedom to do what I want. I have to do it this way. It sounds a lot like what Paul was just saying in Romans chapter 7. I am going to do this. I am not going to do this, but I am going to do this. Oh, I found myself doing this. No, I don't want to do it. I want. It's I, me, my all over again. It's this selfishness. It's somehow saying, well, I couldn't die on the cross. Jesus did that. But now that he's done that, now somehow the burden has shifted to me. And now I have to do everything. Uh, or I have to do nothing. Because Jesus took care of it, and so I can just do it however I want to do it. I can live my life however I want to live my life. Both of these errors are still prevalent today. That You will still encounter people today that say, you know what, I can do this because I have liberty, I have freedom. I, you know, inside, don't judge me because inside I know what God is saying to me. And so outside I can do whatever I want to. And then there's these other people saying, you know, I can't believe that you're doing that because this is what you have to do. You have to live like this. It has to be this way. And how dare you do it this way because it's got to be this way. Now, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, a relationship with God frequently is pictured as a marriage. Okay? You with me? Now, I want you to, want you to think about something. Let's imagine a marriage where one or both spouses take this approach where they say, I want to do what I want to do. They say to their spouse, it doesn't really matter what you want. I, I, I'm going to do what I want to do. I still feel good about this marriage inside. I, I feel good, but I, I'm just going to do what I want to do. How far do you think that marriage is going to go? I think it's going to be pretty successful. If one or both spouses are saying, hey, it's just, you know, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Well, what about this other extreme over here? If one spouse, say the, the wife says to the husband, here's how you have to do marriage. Or the husband says to the wife, this is how it has to be done. You have to do it like this. Both of those things are going to kill a relationship because... It's not a relationship. Pretty simple. It's, it's not a relationship. If two people that are supposed to be joined together to become one person, and one of them keeps keep saying, or both of them keep saying, well, I'm going to do what I want to do, they're not one person. They're, they're two people. And they're really not in a relationship. They're just in it for themselves. But it's the same thing if one wants to try to control the other and say, you have to do it this way. No, you have to do it this way. It has to be like this. No, it has to be like this. That's not a relationship either. That's just two people trying to manipulate and control the other person. The marriage is not going to be successful. No relationship would be successful that way. And yet that's the picture in Scripture of God saying, I'm going to be your husband. And if we're going to grow in this relationship, we, we can't have these extremes. We have to have the healthiness of the inner witness and the outer evidence but you can't take this extreme of, well, I got the inner witness, so now I can do whatever I want to, or here's what I'm, I have to do this. Now, I want you to see how Jesus, in his life, totally blew up both of these things, okay? Let me give you a couple of examples on the um, I want to do what I want to do part. Let's look at Jesus as the exact opposite of that. As they're approaching the Last Supper, okay, the, this time that they're going to, to eat together, I like how John's gospel says it. It says that Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his authority. At that moment, Jesus knew that he was the most powerful, influential person whose feet were standing on planet Earth. He knew that at a snap of his finger, legions of angels could show up and deliver him from what was going to happen. He stood before Pilate at, at, at his trial, and Pilate says, don't you know what I can do? And Jesus said, don't you know that you don't have any power over me at all, except if God had given it? Okay. So what did Jesus do at that moment when he said, I'm the most powerful person here? He got down on his hands and knees and started washing dirt and crud and animal feces mm -hmm. off of people's feet. And when he got done, he said, now I've set you an example. You should serve other people the way I served you. 
you ever think that you are got it all made, that you're this high and mighty, hey, look at me. All authority has been placed under me. And what did I choose to do with it? I cho chose to get down and serve. Right after they left here, they go into the garden and Jesus prays. What was his prayer? Father, not what I want, but what you want. Not my will be done, but your will be done. Not I want what I want, but God, I want what you want. What's going to bring you glory? What's going to help make your name great? That's what I want to do. And so then, writing about marriage in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul said this, Hey, I want you to consider Jesus who gave himself up for the church. He gave everything for his bride. Not, he didn't come into the relationship saying, Here's, I want what I want, and I'm going to get out of this what I want out of this. He said, I'm giving up everything for you. And even then, the writer of Hebrews said that, that Jesus... For the joy set before him, he said, I'm going to go through the cross. I'm going to go through all the scorn, all the pain, all the mistreatment, because I know the joy that is on the other side of this. It was not, I want what I want, but it was, Father, what do you want? What can we do to show this love for these people that we're going to rescue? What about this have to? You know, Jesus turned that upside down. He flipped it around. And it wasn't have to for him. It was want to. It was get to. It was I'm glad that I am able to. Not like, fine, I got to do this. I'll do it. He said, no, I get to do this. On the day that we call Palm Sunday, Jesus is hearing the cheers of people, but he knows that in just a couple of days, those cheers for, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord are going to turn to crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And still at that moment, Jesus didn't say, fine, I have to go through this. He said, I long, like a mother hen, I long to take all of you as my chicks and just bring you underneath my wings. I want to, I want to cover you with my love. I, I want this. I don't, nobody's forcing me to do it. I don't have to do this. I want this. Come, come over here. Come close to me. Let me I want this. As Jesus approached that Last Supper, he's got 12 guys around him. One of them has already accepted the money to, to sell him out. The other 11, Jesus knows, are all going to just, in a matter of a couple hours, are all going to desert him. But he didn't look at those guys and go, well, okay, fine, it's, it's Passover, we've got to do this. We, you know, this is what we have to do. It's not what he said. He looked at those 12 guys that were going to all bail on him, and he said, I have eagerly, earnestly desired to share this meal with you. I've, I've, so, I've so looked forward to this time. Really? In just a couple of hours, these guys are all going to go, later, we're out of here, we're not going to be a part of this. And he says, no, I, it's not, I, I don't have to do this. It's, it's not a requirement that, you know, I don't want to do this. And then again, I love how the writer of Hebrews tells us about Jesus said to his father, here I am. I've come to do your will. Not like, do I have to do this? I'm here. I get to do this. I get to bring glory to you, Father. This is all going to be for your glory because I'm going to pay the price and I'm going to win all these people back. They can all be redeemed back to you. Jesus destroyed those two extremes that people, those errors that people go to saying, well, it's, it's all inside, so now I can do whatever I want to, or no, it's all on the outside. I've got to do it this way because I've got to look good on the outside. doesn't matter what's going on, uh, happening on the inside. I've just got to look good on the outside. I have to do these things. Jesus said, no, that's not that. It's this cycle that the Holy Spirit is going to witness inside that you're in a relationship with me, and out of that it's going to flow this outside evidence. And when you look at that, the Holy Spirit inside is going to rejoice or the Holy Spirit's going to correct and say, no, we need to change that a little bit. And then you have the inner witness and then the external evidence, and, then the, and it just keeps flowing. That's how we grow in this relationship. Relationship. This marriage that Jesus paid for. So with, with that in mind, let, let's go back to, to Romans chapter 8. Because I want you to see how 
Paul begins to address these things in here. Let's pick up uh, at the beginning of chapter 8. We, we left off at verse 4. Verse number 5. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. Okay, there's that I want what I want. Okay. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. Now notice what the Spirit desires. So not I have to do this, but the Spirit inside of me is desiring me to do this, and so I get to do this. I, I want to do this, not I have to. The mind of the sinful man is death. The mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. The selfishness in either extreme, I want what I want, or I have to do it this way, those controlled by that sinful, selfish nature cannot please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, if you have invited Jesus to come into your life. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you. Now here comes another, therefore, in light of all of that, now let's address this other error. Therefore, brothers, you have an obligation. Again, people stop right there. But what does it go on to say? But it is not to the sinful nature. It's not to those two extremes, I want or I have to. Okay? It's not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if the Spirit, but by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. We're, we're his children now. Now, let's look at what, how John addressed this in 1 John chapter 3. I, I love, if you ever wanted to sum up everything that John wrote, he wrote five books, the Gospel of John, his three epistles, and then the book of Revelation. All five of those books, you could sum up what John said like this. Jesus loves me, and this is how I'm going to live. Uh, that all of his books, that, that's what, because Jesus loves me, this is how I'm going to live now. Right? So love just permeates everything that he says. So look at chapter 3. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. Not skimpy, he lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now that we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, we, we, don't, we haven't seen all of it yet, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, how are we going to live in the light of that love? Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he, speaking of Jesus, is pure. If we have this hope, we purify ourselves because we want to look like Jesus. We want to represent him well. So when I read verse 24 earlier, I only read the second part of that verse. Look at the first part. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And then we read this part already. And then this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. So in both, in, in, in Paul's writing is in Roman 8 and John's writing here in 1 John 3, we see in both of those, that, hey, there, there's both, that there's this inner witness, but there's also, there should be something different about my life. When people look at me, if I have a relationship with Jesus, they should be able to tell there's something different about my life. They shouldn't say, you look like everybody else that I know. They should say, there's something different about you. Look at a couple of verses. Peter and John are standing before the religious leaders in, in Israel. And it says when they looked at them, they said they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They're like, just looking at these guys, we tell there's something different about them. 
It just shines out from there. There's something about them that's not the same as we see with everybody else. Later on in this chapter, then, Luke sums up how they live together uh, as fellow believers, and it's, it sent a message to the community. It said all the believers were one in heart and mind. And look at all, all no selfishness here, no I want what I want or I have to do this. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. And you read a little bit farther, and it says, and throughout the community, people looked on them with favor. They're like, we've never seen anybody live like this before. We've never seen this before. But I want you to look especially, if we have the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, there is this external evidence that the Bible refers to as fruit that comes out of our life. And Galatians 5 says this, here's what the fruit is. It's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know what? All of those fruits, they're all external. That's where you see it. How do you, how do you know if somebody's filled with joy? How do, you, how do you know if somebody really is a patient person? How do you know if they have self-control? Just because they say it's inside? You see the fruit blossoming out of their lives. And that's that ongoing, there's this inner witness of the Holy Spirit. And then there's this outward evidence. And so I, tr the, the Holy Spirit says, hey, because you're loved, why don't you love? And then I, I try to love somebody a certain way, and then the Holy Spirit says, good job. Or the Holy Spirit says, you know, it's a good start. I bet you could do it a little better. I bet you we could tweak this a little bit more. Hey, you know what? One of the fruits is the inner witness. You, you, should, be, you should be at peace. You, you don't need to be anxious. And, you know. So here's a situation. How can you on the outside show that you're full of peace on the inside? What can you do in there? And then the Holy Spirit says, good job. Or the Holy Spirit says, hey, let's work on this. Inner evidence, outward, inward, outward. It's this flow. Boy, doesn't that look a whole lot like a relationship? You give something to somebody, you hear how they respond, and then you process it, and you give something back to them, and they give something to you. That's the way that our relationship with Jesus is supposed to flow. That's why he put his spirit inside of us. Don't get caught up in these two selfish extremes. Well, you know what? I, I can just do it however I want to, because I'm saved, you know, I'll... I'll, I'll get to heaven someday, but in the meantime, I want to have some fun. I want to do what I want to do. Or don't get over here, fine, got to do it like this. Those aren't enjoyable. And, and Jesus said, if, if I, I, the reason why I came to give you life is not just eternal life that you've got someday in the sweet by and by. I came to give you abundant life right now, today. So show it with some love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Show that. Let, let people see what's going on on the inside. Let them see on the outside. The question we always need to be asking ourselves is, are people more attracted to Jesus because of seeing me? Do, do, can they tell that Jesus is in my life? Or is it just an internal witness? Do they have to, do they have to guess at it? Or... Is God getting the glory? Is it sola deo gloria? Is it sola Christos? Is it sola gratia? I, I, I didn't deserve this gift, but boy, I'm so glad that God's grace. Is it by faith only that, that I've entered into this, or am I trying to add something to it? Are people seeing that in my life? And if they are, am I just trying to fake it because I don't really feel it inside? Or do I have the inner witness as well? God wants to give you both of that, that inner assurance and then the external fruit that other people can say, hey, I know what's going on inside. He wants to help you in both of those things. We're going to serve um, communion together. I thought this was a, a great Sunday for us to be able to partake of communion together. We already looked at, um, you guys, you can go ahead and grab those trays. Um, we already looked at a couple of 
verses that surround that last supper time where Jesus says, I eagerly desire to have this time with you. I want to serve you by just by giving to you. And so um, they're going to serve you. It's a stack of two cups. Would you just take both of those cups and hold on to those for just a minute? We're just going to wait until everybody has been served. And then we're going to partake of that together and remember what Jesus did for us. He became sin who knew no sin that we might be 